So my talk is entitled, Where Should Sustainability Research Going? And that is due, in large part, actually, to being here and to participating in the kinds of research that you have done. Much of that through the EREC, some of it also in a more direct way, in different ways. But I have, over the last three or four years, been able to sort of not only begin to bring together the research that I've done over many years, over 30 or 40 years, but I've also been very influenced by things that have been happening here. And so this talk is partly a scientific talk, partly not a scientific talk, uh, simply a talk with lots of photos to show you some of our experiences, not only in Japan, but also in Japan. And so I want to simply share some of the ideas that inspired me about the way forward for our science, and maybe even a little bit for our world if we are ever going to do something rather than talk about sustainability. So, this is the first image. Have you seen this image before, anybody? This is a group of people in London, the uh, environment extremists, they're not quite called like that, but something similar, who over the past two months have regularly, almost every day, organized big manifestations in London to protest against the fact that the British government and governments in general talk about sustainability and talk about the Anthropocene, but don't do anything. And their argument is that the governments are actually lying to us because the reality of the situation is much more serious than we all are being told. This is another image like that, that has come up. And I think this one you probably do know. This is Greta Thunberg in the meeting of the United Nations, where she, <laughs> she was in a major way telling governments that this was just not enough and that they had to do more and that her generation feels that they have been cheated of their life. This, I think you may recognize, because this is in your own town. This is here in Kyoto. And it's a protest march against climate change. And as you can see up in the front, and I don't know if this thing works, yes. Here, this are the Sustainable Development Goals that the United Nations uh, voted in uh, 2015. Now, that's the protest. What is the reality? Well, this is a very scientific way to, sim to symbolize the reality. This is a graph of temperature change over the last 2,000 years, which is based on tree rings in the high Sierra of California and Arizona, where the width of tree rings actually has a direct relationship with the temperature under which that year the actual trees have grown. So what I'm trying to say with all of this, and only this one slide, but because there are a few more coming, is that global warming is real. And you see it here in Japan with the typhoons that are coming and you see that right now in many other places. So global warming is real. One way to illustrate it is this image. This is the same glacier in two different, at two different moments in 1989 and in 2019. And it shows the extent to which in Iceland this glacier has actually simply melted away and will not be able to come back. This image shows you with satellite imagery the situation both for Antarctica and for Greenland. Antarctica is here on the left and you can see that these are areas where ice is very heavily melting and where not so long ago, about a month ago or maybe two months ago, the largest ice chunk ever has detached from the continent and has gone into the sea to melt. This image on the left-hand side shows Greenland in 1992 
and in 2002, and it shows the depth of glaciers that are still prevailing on Greenland. Anik and I had the good fortune to visit that. That is the photo that you see in the program that you have been handed. That was taken here in Ilulisat, the area where most of the Western icebergs are actually being created, where over the last 20, 30 years, the speed with which the ice disappears has more than doubled, and you can actually measure it and see it in front of your eyes. So, then a classic image, oh, this has gone too fast. A classic image from the literature that most of you will have seen. These is the acceleration of change in a general sense. On the left-hand side, it is the first image is carbon dioxide, and then nitrous oxide, methane, stratospheric ozone, and a whole bunch of other measurables in gases and in other parts like ocean acidification that shows the extent to which environmental change has very drastically and rapidly changed. Now the interesting thing is that we can show the same for society. And that is of importance in my talk particularly because most climate scientists are really not taking that into account. What we see there is population growth, the growth of GDP, the growth of a number of other things, urban population, primary energy use, and in another one of these similar things, it is even the number of McDonald hamburgers that are being eaten that has also exploded on us. So that's sort of that. What this image shows is a work that we did in 2009 which basically shows that we're beginning to get not only at the limits of what the Earth can support, but getting over the limits that the Earth can support, particularly for biodiversity, for example, on the left-hand side. Now, I have tried to sort of make this more visual for you, and for that I have taken an image from the forest fires, or wildfires, I should say, because it's not just forest, that have basically been ravaging much of California in the last two years. One of the interesting results of that is that for the first time in the American Senate and uh, House of Representatives, these fires have finally made people think that there is something wrong. And the question now is, will all of California burn before it actually gets really penetrated? Because Trump, in his wisdom, has canceled all financial support for the state of California firefighting because he felt the governor hadn't done his duty. So we are in very, very serious trouble. These are some other effects on society. And these are two very famous uh, tornadoes, one Katrina and the other Sandy, that have played out over the last few years. In both cases, they were predicted, and they were predictable, and nobody actually listened to those predictions until after the fact. But that is not all, and where I want to get at, more importantly in this particular lecture, is that it is also our societies themselves that are beginning to hit planetary boundaries. And this is one of the ones that I like. I was in Manila a number of years ago, around that time, and took this photo of the center of town, which is one of the biggest uh, shanty towns in the world. On the other side is the center of Dubai, where we were in 2003, which this photo is a bit later, because when we saw it, it was still a relatively small provincial town but where now you see the highest skyscraper in the world, you see artificial uh, ski ramps and so on and so forth. What does that, what drives that? And now I'm afraid I have to go a little bit into some statistics. And this is the only slide of statistics that I'm going to show you. So watch out. This is population increase. And this is Latin America, this is Africa. A huge population increase is ongoing. We expect that in the next 50 years, 
the population of Africa will have grown to 2 billion people. This one is an interesting graph. It shows how most money nowadays is no longer being invested in any productive activity, but is basically being invested in speculation on the stock exchanges of the world. That is that green graph, and the red graph is what is being invested by companies in their own survival. Another aspect is the world debt. And here you see, and now I need to put my glasses on because I can't read the little writings. Oh boy, this is going to be difficult. Anyway, what it symbolizes is the amount of debt accumulated by the world. And what you see particularly is how oh, since 1990, and even more so since 2008, that has actually exploded, particularly in the English-speaking countries. And that is not surprising then, that in this graph, which compares the Anglo countries, that is the United States, Canada, Australia, and Britain, with the rest of continental Europe. This point here is 1980, when Reagan and Thatcher basically big boomed, as they called it themselves, the stock exchanges of America and Britain. That led in all the Anglo countries to a huge increase in the difference between the poor and the rich. European countries have a different system, and so they have not gone so far that way. They're beginning to get there, but it's not yet at that point. What this all symbolizes is the huge discrepancy in wealth between the 99.9% .9 of the world population and the 0.001% of the rich part of the population who, owe in the United, who own in the United States more than 50% of all the wealth. And to give you a, a figure that I cannot put on a slide, but that is nevertheless a reality, I know one person, one family in the United States who earns $220 million per month to give you a sense of what this all amounts to. This is what the reaction is. And I've taken it initially from Paris, where actually, thanks to Stéphane, who is here, we had a wonderful afternoon interview with a group of these yellow vests on their roundabout, because they meet, they meet at roundabouts because they think they're a total waste of money, and they're, I think, generally right. And what this second one shows is the mask of this man. That mask is actually original from England. It is a Guy Fawkes mask. Guy Fawkes was a man who in the 17th century wanted to blow up the British Parliament. And he had stocked a huge number of casks of powder, explosive powder, in the cellars below the chambers. And he was discovered just before he set fire and exploded the whole building. That has led in Britain to a celebration every 5th of November, that is around our time, to celebrate that it didn't explode. What has happened is that these masks have now been used all over the world to actually mask protesters against their powers and make sure that they can't be identified. And what you see here is Barcelona, Seoul in South Korea, Accra in Ghana, and Managua in Nicaragua. What I'm trying to symbolize with this is that right now, in front of our eyes, over the last few months, a very serious discontent is actually manifesting itself all across the world. And in various ways, I personally believe that this shows the extent to which our focus on CO2 is actually being the wrong thing to attack. CO2 is easily measurable. It is easy to handle for the politicians. But it is actually not the root cause of what is happening right now. Some of the statistics that I've shown you are much closer to the root cause, which is actually the deplorable way in which the Western countries have overexploited most of the world 
to try and become rich. And that has been going on for four or five centuries. So, where do we go from there? This is Beirut in Lebanon, another place where at one point I was able to go and where now it has become impossible to go, just like Syria where I worked for quite a number of years. So there is a worldwide wave of anger. And as scientists, we focus ourselves on the environment. I think that we need to drastically change that. If you interview millennials, that is people who were born in the 1990s and 2000s, 70% of them think that climate change will drastically change their lives. At the same time, a statistic that I picked up in the last few days in the New York Times, there is now a wave of people that get depressions because they think about climate change. So one of the things that could happen, I don't see it happening as it is right now, but if this goes on for a number of years, I do see it happening, that climate change and every related issue as it is now interpreted by many societies will actually be the banner for a worldwide wave of change. Why do I say that? Well, very much under the impression of the discussion with the yellow vests in France. Those people, about a year ago, had all kinds of unexpressed, unexpressible, unclear senses of unhappiness. And in the nine months that they have held meetings every Saturday, they have transformed all those unhappinesses in a collective political agenda, which they are now trying to spread throughout the country. I think that many of these revolts that we're seeing right now are laying the groundwork for similar kinds of movements and that ultimately in many countries those movements will try and explode. So we have seen some of those already, the Arab Spring, Hong Kong, Chile, Catalonia and so on and so forth. But the other side of it is of course the people who basically deny this and Trump today has signed the declaration that they're leaving the Paris uh, Climate Accord of 2015. They had engineered that very cleverly because he can only leave it the day after the next election and we all hope that he will not be there. But nevertheless, this is a problem. We see in lots of Europe, but also in other places, a lot of populism and the rise of extreme right. The question that you have to pose is why is this populism rising? And I have a particular idea about that that I'm happy to share with you, which is that due to globalization, the whole world is now so focused on money as the only way to distinguish yourself from other people that it has imp become impossible or very difficult for people in a society to on the one hand be part of that society and on the other hand to distinguish themselves as individuals. If you want to have a society that allows that, you need a society with many dimensions where you can distinguish yourself through music or through literature or through farming or through any other activity. The world has gone through globalization to a point where that is no longer the case. A fellow countryman of yours, but one that is no longer sort of visible, a systems engineer that I met in the 70s, he basically said, well, you know what is going on? Compare this money race to a, high, to a, a highway where cars are racing. And what you see is that if you make everybody go in the same direction, the only way they can start competing is by speed. That's what we're seeing with money right now. So what is very impressive in this discussion with the yellow vests, and which I think is the case also in most of the other countries that are working on, that are having these issues, is that the people involved not only are poor, but they feel completely isolated from the rest of society. They feel that they are no longer counting in society. 
And so the emotional side of these revolts is at least as important as the economic or the climate or any other side of them. So now I'm going to get to what is the more scientific part of this whole discourse, which is all about the role of the information revolution in our societies. And my starting point is that it is basically information processing collectively by a number of people that shapes a society and it shapes its institutions. It shapes how it creates its environment and so on and so forth. Why am I taking that perspective? Well, we know that there are three major commodities that humans process, matter, energy, and information. Well, the problem with matter and energy is that they cannot be shared. If I have an object and I give it to somebody else, I don't have it anymore. I used to do this with a piece of chalk in my classes and I would throw it at the student in the front row to demonstrate that they now had the chalk and I didn't have it anymore. The same goes for energy. So information is the only thing that people can share among each other. And that is why I think it is so important in shaping our societies. It is not the things that we have, but it is the knowledge about how to get them, how to make them, what to do with them, that is actually what we share in a society. So information, ca oh, oops, sorry. information can be shared and transmitted. It creates coherence, because if people all have more or less the same knowledge, they act more or less the same way. And that way, they can more or less stay peaceably together. But it also, and that is something that Stefan and I are going to be looking into how it actually works, but this information processing also shapes the structure of the society and its institutions. It promotes shared culture. And very importantly, it actually promotes shared values. And every society has its own values, and we need to take that into account. What drives that? And that, to my mind, is relatively simple, and this slide and the next one, try and put that in words. Imagine that you are a prehistoric person who is running around the forest two million years ago or something like that. And they have to deal with that forest. They observe things and they start dealing with them, explaining them, making them useful for themselves. That builds an amount of knowledge and insights. As they have those, that makes it possible for them to actually observe more complicated issues that they need to deal with. And so you get a positive feedback loop in which observations create knowledge, knowledge create observations, and observations create more knowledge. That's when this is an individual. But what is clear in the next slide is that it also happens collectively. And we see that in prehistory from about 50,000 BP, we see that people start processing information collectively and making all kinds of new inventions that they haven't thought about before. And that's been a long time before, so they could have thought about it, but they didn't. And that is what I show here at the collective level. And it is exactly the same mechanism, except that once the individual capacity of information processing is exceeded, the society can actually try and do it collectively. That means that as more information is available, that also involves more people. And so there is another feedback loop between information processing and the demographic growth, which goes up and down, but which clearly over the last 50, 60 years has exploded on us. And I refer here, because we have been making many discussions over the last couple of days, uh, with the perspective that Professor Morasse uh, is defending, that this all has to do with a very fundamental mechanism 
that operates at the monocellular level, at the level of animals and plants, but also at the level of humans. That is that we take signals in and we emit, emit signals. And in the process, we change them. And that creates this growth that I'm talking about. Where are we now? We are now in the fourth global revolution. There have been three earlier ones. The first one took about two million years. And it was how people learned to actually deal with matter. We can follow that, and I have not put the slides in here because that would lead us far too far, because we can follow how they make stone tools. And we, we can follow how the first stone tools they make have very little use of cognitive capacity, and the ones that they make around 50,000 have much more capacity. They actually, you can describe the process as people always dealing with objects in, that are in three dimensions, but for most of the time, they don't know that they're in three dimensions because three dimensions don't exist in their minds. That is what is beginning to happen around 50,000. The next revolution is the revolution of the environment. Around 12,000 years ago, people start cultivating. They start herding animals. They start living in villages. And so for the first time, what changes is that people don't only harvest what nature presents, ripe fruits, salmon in rivers, and things like that, but people start investing in the environment. They start clearing forests. They start tilling the soil and seeding and waiting six months to actually get a result. So it is also the time that risks emerge because uncertainties are everywhere always, but risk is only something when you have invested something, then you can lose it. So the last uh, uh, big revolution before this one is the mastery of ener energy due to the finding of fossil energy and ways to actually harness that fossil energy to do the things that we want to do. So now we are getting to the nub of things. We are in the process of mastering information itself. That's just beginning. And we see already the huge changes that are happening everywhere. And I will get to some of those on the next slide. Those changes are going to be very profound. They're going to completely change our societies. But we don't know how, and we cannot predict how. We cannot predict how long that might take. We don't know where it will go. And we don't know what will be the delay between the new inventions and society actually being able to deal with them. Now, one thing that is fundamental for me and in the whole discourse that I am giving is that the web, as a result of already earlier developments like television and things like that, is changing the boundary between signals and noise. In any society, there is a degree of agreement about what is acceptable. Those are the values of that society. The things that don't fit that are considered noise, not so important. What is happening right now is that because everybody can communicate with everybody, everybody can emit an opinion that that person thinks is a value, and that means that there is no clarity anymore no social clarity anymore about what a society concerns values and what it doesn't. And the moment that was expressed was the day after Trump was inaugurated as his president, when his press secretary said that they no longer presented the truth, but they presented alternative truths. Since then, we're in a situation where people don't really know anymore or cannot maintain, or at least young people have a difficulty understanding the values of our societies. 
And that, I think, is a major threat to all of what is existing right now. This is simply a couple of slides, one on the left-hand side, showing the increase in information processing capacity worldwide. On the right-hand side, it is an interesting slide, because what we know is that every time, and it happens every five years, more or less, the information technologists invent a completely new system, it takes society about 15 years to get used to it. Which basically means, if you look at that through a long-term time, that society is completely losing control over what actually is happening in information processing. And I think that is a very fundamental phenomena, phenomenon of today. So, there are positives, of course, to the information revolution. We have satellites, we have GPS systems, we have remote sensing. In Japan, where you have a much more complicated system of addresses for people's streets and so on, the wonderful thing is that you put your telephone number in the GPS and you get there, which for people that are not used to that is a real miracle, and I have experienced that. You have smartphones, you have the web, you have Twitter, Facebook, Academia, ResearchGate, all those social networks. And what that means is that you can now message from one person to another person, but also from one person to many, and from many to one, and from many to many. So everybody can communicate with everybody else. And that basically means that what used to be the case, and that is that we had certain values in society, and those values were more or less respected or maintained through the press, through ra radio, through what was inherent in people's feelings about what had to happen, that that is now basically sort of disappearing. And some of these negatives that we see everywhere are the hacking and the loss of privacy, the fact that we now have a surveillance society in which cameras everywhere, for example in Britain, know where you are at any time, where there are companies in the United States that know 5,000 details about your life and maintain them and use them for the elections. We have a lot of work to do, and that is a fundamental thing that our societies have not really done on the negative side of technology. You know, when I talk to business people or politicians about the environment, they all say, oh, we will invent our way out of trouble. What they forget is that it's two and a half centuries of innovation in every which way that have got us into trouble. And according to Einstein and other people, you cannot use the same thinking to get out as that you used to get in. And I think that is part of what our dilemma is right now. Now, a few elements of what the information revolution, I think, on the long term is actually doing. So I begun with the erosion of the distinction between signal and noise. Basically, it means that we have much less of a certainty about the categories and values in our life. And that means that there is a loss of structure in the way we collectively think. I'm not talking about individuals here. There is a difference in the conception of space and time. Space almost no longer exists. Time has been transformed from something that was measured in hours or days to things that was, to thing that was measured in nanoseconds, which we cannot observe anymore as human beings. But just as important, the information revolution is changing a number of the fundamentals of our political and social order. One of the things that it is doing is that it is helping the end of the political order that we established in Europe in 1648. Then politicians got together and they decided that they were going to do two things in Europe. On the one hand, they were promising each other that they would not interfere in each other's territories and on the other hand, they created a balance of power between the different dominant powers. Well, it's very clear that that is no longer the case. We now have foreign interference in elections. 
which means that the boundaries have been crossed. We also, and that is an interesting phenomenon that the weight of that to me is not yet clear, that for a while we have had no balance of power. We are now beginning to get another balance of power between China, the US, Europe, and Russia, but for a while we didn't have any. We also see the erosion of our democratic systems. What we see is that there are now so many information sources that it's much more difficult for a majority to emerge. And more than that, what we see is that political parties are no longer very relevant. They used to be the mechanism by which politicians linked with the population that they were governing. They don't anymore. They simply call a company and it tells them what the whole population has for values and then they know exactly where to go to get the right people to come and vote. That is what the scandal of this Cambridge Analytica mentioned. But to me, even more fundamental, and not only due to the information revolution, because it started, I think, long before that, is the erosion of our sense of communities. This is something that in Japan is not as manifest, and I'll get back to that later on, as it actually is in the United States in particular, and in Europe to an extent. Urbanization has ripped people out of their social communities and has put them together as individuals in a very different world. And that is a completely different thing. And for me, that became clearest when Anik and I were traveling in China, in Inner Mongolia, and we actually saw a town there which had, had been built and there was nobody living in it. Why was that? The government had decided that the environment was being threatened by too many animals. So they forbade owners to have more than a certain number of animals, which was not sufficient for those people to live on. So they all got rid of their land and their herds. They came into cities, but they don't know how to behave in cities. They actually sit on the sidewalk and fold plastic bags because they don't know what to do. They don't know how to get a house. They don't know how to live. They don't know anything. That shows some of the difficulties that we're going through when these people are losing their community and are forced to behave socially in a different way. So what I'm trying to say with all of this, and there are many other aspects of this that I haven't sort of put in here, is that there is a huge unintended destabilization of society going on. And I think it's that destabilization that is responsible in many ways for the kinds of movements as we now see worldwide, as I symbolized with the different places where they had the Guy Fawkes masks. So what is this doing among other things? It's destroying the middle classes because the, the spread between the poor and the rich is now going so wide that the middle classes lose some of their function. Another problem that is particular to the West is that there is a huge problem with employment. Automatization is threatening to make 40% of the population unemployed, which is a rather dramatic number. And much of that is middle class that is being destroyed. Another thing that all of this does is to reset the balance between urban and rural. Right now, urban and rural are completely disconnected. And it's amazing to me that many scientists claim themselves to be only interested in cities. Of course, the cities are related to their environment and you cannot deal with only the rural or only the urban. So what we need to do, and that is something positive that we're beginning to see, is movements towards local resource exploitation, local food, local energy, with solar or wind energy and things like that. You have to realize that although everybody predicts that by the end of the century, 80 or 90% of the world population will live in cities, I don't believe that at all. 
I think cities are incredibly vulnerable. They demand huge amounts of energy. They demand huge amounts of transportation. And I don't think that over the next 50 years, those will be available to actually cater to the cities and make them further grow. Moreover, I think that many cities were emerged because people wanted to interact closer. And now that you can do that over the web, I think the drive for that is getting less. And one of the most interesting ones that I read recently in a paper by Brian Arthur is the move from econ in our economies from production to distribution. What he basically argues is that we're on the way to have a possibility to create everything that we need by machines. That means that people are no longer involved in the production process. Now that seems an economic issue, but it is not. Because people, for themselves, define their value and their status by their participation in the production process. So if we no longer have a production process, we have to transform our societies, and we have to find different values for everybody that make them happy and more or less satisfied, and that is not going to be an easy task. Moreover, that also means that politicians are going to have to find very different ways of dealing with the economics of that. All of this, in my mind, is hugely enhanced by globalization, and I've already talked about the, uh, the relationship between globalization and populism. But the fact that communication is spreading across the world has done to many cultures what you do if you take a steamroller and roll over a person. That is, you flatten them out. And what has happened is that many cultures have not been able to resist adopting all these Western values and therefore have lost their own values. And I'm getting back to that in the case of Japan at the very last end of my talk. What I said already is that I think you need communities with very complex sets of values to actually maintain those communities healthy. So I think that globalization is at the root of this emerging populism, and if globalization doesn't stop, we're going to be overrun by populism. So now, science. This is a group of famous, or more or less famous, scientists. And they're simply symbolizing the fact that science predicted climate change and warned the world, but not much was done. And that I think, and I have actually, I'm about to publish a paper on this, to done, done with 17 other scientists, that science itself has been not only inadequate in dealing with sustainability, but that science, to some extent, has been the cause of our sustainability problems. Because it is the science that has enabled the technology that has actually caused those problems. So what do we need to do? We need to now begin to take into account not only the technology and the environment, but also society itself, and the effects of these things on society. Now this to me is a really wonderful saying, and it is Desmond Tutu who basically said when white missionaries brought the Bible to Africa, they had the Bible and we had the land. And they said, let us pray. So we closed our eyes and we prayed, and when we opened our eyes, we had the Bible and they had the land. I think that's what's happening, and I think that's what's happening to science. I think science has been blind to the fact that it's beginning to erode its own credibility and its own trust and its own prestige. And that is what I think is what the next part of my talk is all about. This is how millennials must feel. And what I have experienced a number of times when talking to scientists is that they think that people who don't understand science are stupid. That's not the case. Those people have simply, when they were young, adopted a different way of thinking about things and a different way about relating to things. That is very much determined culturally and locally 
by how people actually grow up. So what I think it is all about is that those people cannot trust science because they have a different way of interpreting the world. Now what is important is that neither science nor trust are actually absolutes. You know, they are dynamic, they are contextual. In many cases where science is not being accepted are due to the fact that the context in which it happens is actually one that alerts people to the fact that scientists, for example, are biased. Because they are on the one hand covering for government or they are actually engaged by industry to either propagate the, the vision of the corporations or to innovate new things for them. So what we need to understand is that understanding itself is a social construct. It is not some absolute thing. It is something that is part of identity construction. The way I experienced that is when I started my European project in 1992, I began to realize that in order to get these 65 scientists from every single discipline to think together, I had to convince them that their identity was not at stake. They all felt that they had to say what was in their discipline because in their discipline they were valued. So I had to give them a different set of values, which were the group values that I created. So the image here, I think, is an interesting one. Science has been cancelled. The class for science has been cancelled because your parents prefer to believe in magic, which is, of course, not at all what is happening. Then another problem between science and society is the one of uncertainty and doubt. Scientists build, I think, an unrealistic vision of life. They take a set of phenomena and then they investigate them and as a result they decide that a whole bunch of things are irrelevant and they only retain the things that they think are relevant because they understand them. That's a complicated way of looking at science. But that also means that there is no real anticipation value. They reduce the number of cognized dimensions, I just said that. They don't consider questions that they cannot answer, which is a really interesting characteristic of very much science. And then the last one is here very important. They accept uncertainty as a limitation, but they don't depend on system response. A scientist who talks to a farmer will identify the farmer's problems and his uncertainties. And then he goes home and forgets about them and goes to sleep. The farmer has to live with them because any decision the farmer makes affects his own life in a major way. And so what farmers do, they acknowledge the full complexity of the system and their incapacity to control it. When my team went into the field, one of the most frequent debates was a scientist talking to the farmer and the farmer saying, look, this is my land. I've lived in this land 25 years. I know every square inch of this land and I know how it behaves. So my knowledge is the best knowledge for this land. And then what can a scientist say? He can say, my legitimacy is because I have not been born here, because I have had a university education. Well, that doesn't wash. You can, I can tell you, we did a lot of that. So the image here, sort of summarizes that. The scientist says, after a comprehensive review of the climate science, we have concluded that climate change is 99.5% certain, not 100%, as we said before. And the skeptic says, I knew it. So we don't believe in the science. Science is basically a community activity. It's a social activity as much as a scientific activity. I had a professor in Michigan whose posthumous book, very famous book, actually argues that science is just another religion. And I'm pointing it that way, and he clearly, he writes 500 pages about it, so it's much more subtle in his case. But the main point is that science is a set of beliefs. 
Science is a set of beliefs in particular methods, particular instruments, particular values, particular results, and that is not so different from other religions. So, for me, and this is my bone of contention whenever I talk to a hard science audience, science as for, seen from an anthropological perspective that is mine, is actually a community activity. It result, its results clearly have changed the world. I'm not saying that. But it's an activity that is carried by a community. And I refer here to some people who've worked about that. It is also subject to change and fashion. You all know Kuhn's work about that. But it's also incredibly messy. And one of the things that many scientists do among themselves, as well as when they talk to the wider public, is to hide the messiness, to hide what actually is not certain. What I'm arguing is that scientists have to open their kitchens and actually share their recipes and all their failures with each other and not only their successes. And so another aspect of the relation between science and society is that in the end, scientists think they're experts. But the society is going to decide what it wants, experts or no experts. That's not really that relevant. OK, then we get to this whole question of truth. Look, objective, objectivity in science is a very important aspect. But it is a limited aspect because it relates a question to an answer. But the question itself is not questioned. The question itself is culturally determined and socially determined and is not in that sense objective. So society constructs its context and values. Excuse me for a moment. I'm going to take a little bit of water here. Be talking. Ah, there is. OK, great. Thank you. So we have objectively observed facts that answer subjectively self-referentially negotiated questions. It's not about true and false, but about defining the domain and the culture and the degree of validity of observations. And so the knowledge is generally reliable within that culture. And what has happened in our case worldwide is that with globalization and the spread of Western culture, the values of that culture and its science have become dominant dominant globally. So I am here just putting a couple of things together that I think are particularly complicated, and there's much work about this, and some of it I've written up, some of it I have not written up. But one of the things that I think is really important is that we need, we dis create closed categories. We distinguish nature from society. This is much less so in Japan, and I'll get back to that later on. Effectively, it's a fictitious thing, and it's something that emerged in Western Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries, that distinction in absolute terms between what is human and what is natural. So I think what one thing we need to do if we move our science forward is to gain by focusing on the relationships and interactions rather than on the entities, on the categories that we are doing. The other thing that I think scientists are particularly bad at is to live with ambiguity and fuzziness. And yet the world, because it is very highly dimensional, is inevitably always fuzzy and ambiguous. So what are we doing with that? Yeah, another thing is the future as an interaction between chance and necessity. There are times when things are more or less organized and things follow the way that has been outlined. There are times when that is not happening at all. So we need to begin to look at a different way of looking at science. Now, I'm going to break here for a moment because this has been a lot already and there is a little bit more coming. I have to tell you that my original programmer said that I had to talk for two hours. I'm not going to do that, okay? I'm going to give you a break now of 10 or 15 minutes, and I think then we'll start again, and then it will be another quarter of an hour, 20 minutes. 
Okay, so let's stop here for a moment for all of you to sort of get out, have a little walk, talk to each other, and then we'll keep on going in, I don't know what it is now. It is uh, well, let, Let's be back by 4.25. Yeah, okay. my sense too. Okay, that's what we do. <laughs>